Okay, let's do, uh, shoot, this actually is volume 19, okay. Prologue. The tea party in the library was brought to an abrupt close when Rosemont collapsed without even the slightest warning. Continuing was hardly an option when the host had fallen unconscious. Hanelor and Hildebrand had looked on in a daze, while Rosemine's head attendant, Rayarda, had sent an ordinance to summon Wolfried and Charlotte. Lord Wolfried, Lady Charlotte, I have leave the rest to you, Rayarda said upon their arrival. I will bring my lady back to the dormitory with her guard knights. Brunhilde, assist them in cleaning up. She curtsied to the prince, who was wide-eyed and chattering his teeth, and obtaining permission to leave. And obtained permission to leave. Then she said a simple farewell to Hanelor before making a brisk exit. Arthur, what happened to Rosemine? Hildebrand asked, his head attendant shaking. What's going on? Hanelor heard the prince's quavering voice and glanced over. Arthur had gone pale. He was trying to think of what to tell his lord, but his understanding of the situation was just as non-existent. Wolfred and Charlotte consoled the panicked Hildebrand and explained to his retainers that Rosemine's collapse was a regular occurrence. Prince Hildebrand, Rosemine often falls unconscious, Wolfred said. My sister's health is especially, <coughs> especially poor, Charlotte added. But there are potions waiting for her at the dormitory that will make everything better. Wolfred then tried to console Hildebrand the same way he had consoled Hanelor the year before, by telling him about the incident with the snowballs, her baptism, and so on, but it had the opposite effect. The prince grew enraged and suddenly demanded, how could you do that to her? Well, he didn't know it was going to happen and he didn't do it on purpose. Dude. Arthur seemed to take solace in the explanation, at least. Some color returned to his pale face and he rested his hands on the prince's shoulders, urging him to stop directing his worry and panic at Wilfried. Prince Hildebrand, these arch two candidates of Arenfest know her very well, Arthur said. If they say she is fine, we may trust that she is. You must not show your emotions so openly. Let us return as well. Hildebrand was young and emotional, but his head attendant Arthur understood the situation well. Because there was a royal in the room, everyone else was forced to prioritize his needs, delaying their work. He gave an apologetic look to Wilfried and swiftly concluded their farewells. Once the prince was gone, Charlotte and Wilfred could begin attending to the remaining guests. Professor Solange, we apologize for having surprised you, Charlotte said. Are you well, Lady Hanelor? Wilfred asked. An archduke candidate of a greater duchy could not allow themselves to lose their composure, and with that in mind, Hanelor repeated over and over again that she was fine. On the inside, however, she was anything but. She simply couldn't forget the way that Rosemont had collapsed and then remained dead still, like a puppet whose strings were suddenly cut. Hanelor could sympathize with the prince's sh alarm. The year before, during the Arenfest tea party to which all duchies had been invited, Rosemont had collapsed to the floor the moment she took Hanelor's hand. She had been smiling up until that moment, but in the blink of an eye, she was unconscious. Hanelor hadn't known what to do, and she didn't know what to do now. A cold sweat ran down her back as she failed to move or speak properly at all. Lady Hanelor, Wolfred said, regarding her with clear concern. Hanelor had assumed that she was wearing a natural smile, but this evidently wasn't the case. Her face kept twitching no matter how much she tried to stop it. Cordula Hanelor's head attendant sensed that her lady was unable to act in a manner befitting an archduke candidate. She placed a hand on Hanelor's shoulder and sought permission to speak. We were surprised by the suddenness of it all, Cordula began, but we are aware that Lady Rosemond was bedridden for days immediately prior to this tea party. She asked us whether we could bring our musicians for the exchange since she had been summoned here back to Arenfest. It is clear that Lady Rosemond was forced to hold this tea party despite being in such ill health due to the prince being invited. Cordula's words were spoken with such cold rationality that Handler's mind finally started working again. In retrospect, Dunkelfelger had indeed been told from the start that Rosemond would be attending this tea party in poor health. If only you had said that sooner, Cordula, I wouldn't have panicked so much. Such a thought ran through Hanelor's mind, but then she realized why Cordula had not spoken until then. Her analysis of the situation could easily have been taken as criticism of the prince. She could never have said such things in the presence of royalty, even if she was just trying to calm her lady. Hanelor looked around and saw that Rosemond's remaining attendants were cleaning up the tea party alongside Solange's attendants. It seemed that best for her to leave sooner rather than later. She had calmed down enough to make that kind of a decision. Um, I believe we should be, she began. I'll take you to your dormitory and explain things to Dunkelfelder, Wolfrey said. Charlotte, can you, can you handle the rest? Certainly, dear brother. I will settle matters with the attendants before returning to our dormitory, Char Charlotte replied, having consoled Solange and directed her own attendants to assist with the cleanup. She seemed unreasonably calm for a first year, which Handler took as proof of just how often Rosemine had collapsed. After escorting Hanelor back to her dormitory, Wilfried explained the situation to her older brother, Lestalot. We truly apologize for startling Lady Hanelor and all those attending the tea party once again, he said, referencing how the same thing had happened the year before. Naturally, everyone in the dormitory was paying close attention. 
You are not to blame for Lady Rosemine's collapse, Lord Wilfried, Handler said, putting on her best smile after she, as she saw him off. Please, do, please tell her that I hope she recovers soon. I am quite fine. As soon as the door closed, however, the strings of tension were abruptly cut and a wave of exhaustion hit Handler all at once. Her emotions had stirred so much that she felt as weary as she usually did after using a ton of mana. She wanted nothing more than to rest in her room, so she began heading for the stairs, but the circumstances were much too serious. Handler, less luck, called out. His red eyes narrowed sharply. Tell me what in the world happened at that tea party. Brother, I would rather wait until after I have calmed down a bit. You know we can't delay our report. This happened in the presence of royalty. You can remain silent and have your retainers give the details on their own, but you still need to be there. Come. There was no room for Handler to refuse when her brother was being so firm, and so she had to go to a meeting room with her retainers before even having an opportunity to rest or change clothes. Were I to collapse at a tea party like Lady Rosemont, I find it hard to believe my brother would ever swiftly rush over like Lord Wilfrid to take care of things for me. No, he'd probably show up, start yelling at everybody for having caused this to happen to her in the first place, and then swiftly take Handler away after telling everybody, yeah, you're not getting anywhere near her now. That seems like how overprotective he is of her. Handler knew there was no point in even comparing the two boys, but she couldn't help but sigh when she pictured the stern face less alongside the warm-hearted Wilfried. Oh, how I wish I had a kind older brother like Lord Wilfried. Gathered in the meeting room were less to lie his retainers, Handler, and those who had accompanied her to the tea party. Handler looked over a board she had received from Cordula, the notes her apprentice scholars had made during the tea party. Such notes were very rarely made during tea parties, since pestilent... Uh, hold on. Post uh, liminary reports were delivered verbally and from memory alone, but Hanalore had deviated from the room in an attempt to copy Rosemine. Thus, no matter how panicked they had grown, they could still speak objectively and without missing any details. It was a very wise decision in hindsight. Rosemine's collapse had been so overwhelming that Hanalore hadn't even been able to remember what they had been talking about prior to it. As I mentioned previously, I have agreed to start donating mana to the library's magic tools as an assistant. This, Handler pointed to her armband as she read from the board, is proof of that fact. We assistants are also being referred to as library committee members. A weird-looking band and a weird-sounding name, Lestalot said quite rudely. Rude. Handler ignored him and continued, explaining that she had supplied mana to Schwartz and Weiss and that Hildebrand would be working with them as a member of the library committee henceforth. Now, what should I say about Lady Rosemine requesting that Prince Hildebrand do one of our jobs? Handler fell silent for a moment, taking a sip of tea to wet her mouth while carefully eyeing her brother. He was always scrutinizing Rosemine's words and actions, so he would no doubt kick up an exaggerated fuss over upon learning of the ordinance prompting incident. Handler ultimately decided to keep it hidden for now. The prince had accepted it without issue, and it had nothing to do with Dunkelfelger. If it truly was important enough to be featured in the report, Cordula would simply mention it later. We exchanged books, Handler said, then Rosemine presented us with a manuscript about Dunkelfelger's history, rewritten in modern vernacular. She wants us to make sure it doesn't contain any mistakes. Hmm, Dunkelfelger's history, you say? Lestelart remarked, very well, I will check it thoroughly to make sure everything is correct. Handler noticed a sinister grin on her brother's face and gave him the hardest glare she could muster. An unfair, unfairly critical evaluation ran the risk of damaging her friendship with Lady Rosemine. She had only recently started to enjoy reading, thanks in large part to Aaron Fest's books being so fun and easy to read, and the last thing she wanted was for Rosemine to start growing distant. Lestalot reached for the stack of papers, but Cordula hugged Clarissa to hug them to her chest. I will not give them to you, Lord Lestalot, she declared. Clarissa, what do you think you're doing? Lestalot exclaimed. She wasn't even Handler's retainer. The tea party had taken place before the usual socializing period, and since Handler hadn't had enough available retainers, she had recruited Archnobles for free time, to accompany her. Thus, Handler looked just as surprised as her brother. Lady Rosemine sought not just for the manuscript to be checked, but for Ob Dunkelfelger to be consulted over whether it could be made into a book with an errand vest, Clarissa said. The Obs of our duchies are going to be discussing this during the Interduchy Tournament. We must send them home at once. Clarissa was using the fact that Archduke Archdukes would soon be involved to reinforce her point. She had been crazy about Rosemine ever since the game of dinner the year before, and no doubt wished to prevent Lestalot's unfair criticisms more than anyone. More than likely, yeah. As Lestalot examined Clarissa through narrowed eyes, trying to determine whether she was being sincere, Handler agreed with a smile. Clarissa is correct, she said. This is an urgent matter. Handler and Lestalot glared at each other, neither person wanting to relent, until eventually Cantrips, the latter's apprentice scholar, cleared his throat. I understand the situation, but as goods are entrusted to us from another duchy, it is necessary that Lord Lestalot be given the opportunity to view them as the future archduke, he said. 
Can you permit him to check them over during the following three days so as to not interfere with the OB's negotiations? I will assume responsibility and deliver them to the OB after three days have passed. Uh, Cantrip's suggestions seem fair to handle her. She could trust her brother's retainers a lot more than she could trust her brother himself. And if Cantrip said he would send the manuscript home after three days, she could believe it. She moved to agree, but Clarissa still seemed unconvinced. She firmly shook her head while continuing to clutch the papers to her chest. If we have three days to wait, I want to spend them reading the manuscript myself, Clarissa declared. This is a book on history written by Lady Rosemine. I can only imagine it is as pleasant and easy to read as all other Aaronfest books. I wish to read it too, one of the others who had attended the tea party called out. I'm terribly curious to see how she translated the heroic tale of Wrangletus. No, 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 another interjected. Forget Wrangletus. What about G Garlshot? The others all seemed curious about one hero's tale or another. Or one hero's tale or another, and they were getting so heated up that they were leaving the Archduke Conference entirely to the side. Handler couldn't help but sigh. Dunkle Felgers were hot. Felgerans were hot blooded by nature, and it often caused trouble. Handler looked up at Cordula, who nodded and forcefully clapped her hands together. Be quiet, the head attendant said. As this is a request from the Interduchy, the Ob takes the highest priority. If we are not in a position to respond before the Interduchy tournament, Dunkelfelger will suffer. For failing here would mean breaking a prom our promise to Lady Rosemine. Her final remark was presumably to hammer the point home for Clarissa. Cordula snatched the papers from her hands and then gave them a close look. These papers seem to be bound with thread. If we take care not to lose it, we can have the pay pile. Cordula? As we are only checking the precision of this modern translation, the Ob will need only half of the manuscript to make his assessment. We can send the first half to Dunglefoger and keep the second here in the dormitory. <laughs> Handler struggled to understand why Cordula was taking such lengths when she just wanted to stop Clarissa and the others from going crazy. Lord Lestalot does not need to check the does need to check the manuscript, but we cannot deprive Lady Handler of seeing it when it was entrusted to her in the first place. Cordula continued, "Please take turns reading the half that we keep hold of. In truth, I cannot say I have much interest in reading Dunkelfelder history. I would much rather spend that time reading Aaronfest's romance story. But you did get that book. You did get that book, so you could keep that one." But despite Handler's misgivings, she did not reject Cordula's suggestion. She knew that she could, would encounter problems during her first tea party with Aaronfest if she avoided reading the manuscript entirely. Lady Cordula, I, Clarissa began. Clarissa, might I suggest that you do your own work, Cordula said, interrupting her. I believe you said you were collecting stories for Lady Rosemine. Did you not? If you send them to her through your, your Aaronfest associate, you will, she will surely be overjoyed. Yeah, I think that's what she was... Oh yeah, she was asked to do something by Hartmut... To make his lady happy. And I'm guessing this is what she decided to do. Clarissa put on a serious face as she considered Cordula's advice. I have transcribed books to complete challenges and for gradings, but I never thought about transcribing for a get well present. You are right, Lady Cordula. Lady Rosemine would surely want rejoice to receive stories while she is so unwell. Handler was glad to see Clarissa so motivated. Her fists were clenched and there was a noticeable sparkle in her blue eyes, but there was something about her words that didn't seem to make sense. She knew that Clarissa had gone crazy for Rosemine entirely on her own at some point, but when she thought back to the tea party, they hadn't seemed to have met before. Clarissa, what do you mean when you say that you transcribe books to complete challenges and for greetings, her, uh, Handler said, or asked, have you met Lady Rosemine before? The young woman's cheeks reddened with embarrassment as she turned her head, causing her braid to sway ever so slightly. Last year, I proposed to one of Lady Rosemine's retainers in the Royal Academy, she said. And the other day, I finally completed the challenge he gave me. I'm hoping to give Lady Rosemine a form more formal greeting at the Interduchy Tournament this year, so... Handler had wondered why Clarissa seemed to know so much about Aaronfest as of late and saw it was now it was finally making sense. She had settled on marrying someone from the Duchy. She was acting for more... Far more adorable than usual right now, so she rejoiced over her proposal having been accepted. Handler felt her own heart warming up just from the sight. I'm glad that you completed the proposal challenges you received, Handler said encouragingly. Do continue to keep gathering stories. I am much looking forward to Aaronfest making a book out of the ones your apprentice scholars have collected. From there, Handler returned to the report. She noted that while she and Rosemine were exchanging their books, Hildebrand had mentioned to his attendant Arthur that he wanted to lend a book too. That was when the notes ended, and presumably when Rosemine had collapsed. The apprentice scholar who had been writing must have been very disturbed by the sudden incident since Arthur's name was cut off midway through. 
with the ink jet jerking away in a line, and then Lady Rosamond suddenly collapsed hard and Hanlor concluded. Huh? But why? Lestalot asked. Lady Hanlor, surely that is not all. Are you forgetting something? One of his retainers added, equally surprised, but there was nothing more to say. Everyone who had attended the tea party had been too shocked by the sudden event to process everything. It truly did happen without warning, one of those who had attended said, backing up Handler, it was so su as sudden as could be. Lady Rosemont's attendants and her siblings handled the situation with trained experience, but we guests had no idea what had happened or what to do, another added. Although they had remained silent at the time, it seemed they had been just as surprised. Enough, Lestalot said. I understand that Handler's report was not incomplete. Do we not have even the slightest idea as to why she collapsed? Lady Rosemont seems to have been bedridden for several days prior to the tea party, and she was so ill that Ob Ehrenfest instructed her to return home, Handler replied. Cordula believes that she might have collapsed after pushing herself to attend the tea party due to the prince being in attendance. I'm impressed that she can be an Archduke candidate while being that sickly, Lestalot said, scratching his head with an annoyed grimace. His poor attitude aside, Handler agreed with Lestalot that Rosemont's position as an Archduke candidate was peculiar. How did she perform Archduke candidate training? With a body that weak, Handler could only tilt her head in disbelief as she thought over the intense training that Ar Dunkelfucker Archduke Candidates received. But perhaps other duchies trained in different ways? There was no point thinking about it. And that is what happened at the tea party, Handler concluded once again, May I return to my room now? My emotions stirred heavily from the surprise and I am exceedingly tired. She wasn't the only one whose emotions had been shaken by Rosemont's collapse. All those who had accompanied her were no doubt equally as tired. Lestalot didn't try to keep them any longer. Once she was finally back in her room, Handler let out a sigh of relief. Cordula was helping her get changed with a sympathetic smile while the retainers who had been too busy with their classes to attend the tea party prepared tea, looking visibly interested in what they had missed. Professor Roffin was quite troubled to find you all in the meeting room, one of the retainers said. He had apparently returned after his classes to find the room locked, and it was only from the nearby students that he had learned about the tea party ending early due to Rosemine collapsing. Oh my, but is Rosemine's health, Lady Rosemine's health not far more important than questioning her about the temple, Handler asked? It seems he thought to have Prince Hildebrand use his royal authority to make Lady Rosemine delay her return, but the prince refused. Ah! Roffin had sent an ordinance to Hildebrand only for him to respond that he refused to order someone to stay at the academy when they needed, to re needed rest in their home duchy. Handler, recalling how disturbed the prince and his retainers had been during the tea party, found the idea of the professor making such a request in the first place laughable. If they wanted information on temple matters, they could consult the Sovereign Temple or even the Temple in Dunkelvogar. Rosemont's health took priority, especially when she was exhausted enough to have collapsed in the presence of royalty, so Handler was beyond glad that he, her rest wasn't going to be disturbed. I am relieved to hear that she will not be forced to overexert herself once again due to a royal order, Handler said. Unlike here in the Royal Academy, she will be able to rest in Arenfest. I hope that she gets well soon. Oh, <laughs> A few days later, Handler received a message stating that Rosemont had awoken and would promptly be departing for Arenfest. Oh boy, post-return discussion. Here we go. Here's a massive lecture coming through. <laughs> I imagine. They're going to be questioning everything. As the swirling of the teleportation circle faded, I slowly opened my eyes. Cornelius' back was the first thing I saw. He had stood in front of me and to the side as my guard. We are to let go of me now that I wasn't in danger of toppling over from nausea. Welcome back, Lady Rosemine, and so I've returned, Angelica, Daniel. Standing in front of the crowd gathered to welcome me were my two guard knights. Daniel looked exhausted, perhaps because he was receiving training from Bonifacius once again. Cornelius walked over to them and began the process of swapping out guard knights. I request that you both take my place guarding Lady Rosemine, he said. I must return to the Royal Academy at once. Won't that be a struggle, Angelica asked quizzically and turned around. She was looking at my guardians, which included the Archducal couple, the Knight Commander couple, Ferdinand and Bonifacius. Cornelius let out a small groan after following her gaze. Oh my, Cornelius, Elvira said, scooting forward. Look, run, Cornelius, run! Get away! Get away before she starts, starts grilling you about all this! Scooting forward to stand between the guard knights, but do we not have much to discuss? Perish the thought of you leaving so soon after your return. Please do spend at least one night with your family. She was smiling on the surface, but her dark eyes were locked onto Cornelius with deadly intensity. Run, Cornelius! You need to get out of there! She's gonna question you about your love life! Oh no! I imagine that's what's gonna happen! Mother, I sent my reply the other day, and I still have classes to attend. Once they are done, I will come home to talk, Cornelius said, his face twitching as he took a step back, trying to get as far away from Elvira as he could. He finishes the guard exchange, then swiftly turned and stepped back onto the teleportation circle. 
Elvira looked as though she had something to say, but she ultimately saw Cornelius off with a giggle. Next time, come home with a bit more manly resolve, dear, and with your partner, of course. Cornelius shimmered and disappeared with a grimace. He had been talking about how he wanted to enjoy his last year as a student to his fullest, but in reality, it seemed that he just wanted to avoid Elvira's probing. Definitely. And I do not blame him. Who wants to be probed about their love life when they want to keep it a secret, especially when they want to keep it a secret from somebody who would put it into a story? His partner, I repeated. Have you finally learned who she is, Mother? We may discuss this in detail during a tea party. There is much I wish must ask of you as well, she replied, and then returned to her place in the crowd. Riarda suddenly pushed me forward, and I moved to greet my other guardians. I have returned from the Royal Academy, I announced. I never expected you to finish your classes this quickly, Rosemine. Bonifacio said, praising me with a grin. My granddaughter really is in a league of her own. I was overjoyed to receive his praise, but my achievement was solely down to me wanting to visit the library sooner. So I wasn't entirely sure how to respond. Unable to puff out my chest with pride and, and boast, I opted to be humble and say it was all thanks to Ferdinand's teachings. It was! Because, to be honest, if they hadn't studied the other stuff in the study guides that Ferdinand had given them from back when he was in school, they probably would have failed uh, Fraulein's uh, sociology exam with what she pulled. So yeah. Rosemont, I'm going to be eating dinner with the rest of you tonight, so how about you tell me how you did, how you slew that Ternish performance, he continued. Your scholar's report said that you were the star of the show. Nope, 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 he was not. Hartman had sent his report while I was bedridden, so I hadn't gotten the chance to read it. Thanks to Felina, I was aware he had extolled my saintly virtues, but that was about the extent of my knowledge. I also knew that I hadn't participated in the fight much at all. My attacks had consistently missed, and I certainly didn't want to speak with Bonifacius about that. Of course, I said, we can discuss how splendidly the Apprentice Knights handled the matter. Thanks to your training, Grandfather, they have learned to coordinate a bit. For a moment, I considered making a pinky promise with Bonifacius, but I realized that doing so would leave me with a broken finger and immediately gave up on the idea. <laughs> yeah, and they wouldn't understand what a pinky promise is anyway. Sylvester was the next to step forward. I've been waiting for you, Rosemine. Come to my office once you get changed, he said. For some reason, his voice was completely devoid of energy. Last year, he had stomped his feet and looked downright furious, but now he seemed kind of dead inside. Because you guys all bro you broke him with all the reports he's gotten. Poor guy is dead inside. It was probably just my imagination, though. Or did something happen while I was away, I wonder? I assume it's all that you've done, Rosemine. I imagine that. I believe briefly returned to my room with Friarda at my guard nights, then headed to the office. Ferdinand, Sylvester, and Karstad were awaiting me inside. Ferdinand was the first to speak. Rosemine, he said, eyeing me carefully while tapping a finger against his temple. I believe we must begin by ensuring we both have the same understanding of the word peaceful. I ask, what does it mean to you? I blinked in surprise, having been prepared for some intense lecturing. Still, I gave his question a serious ponder. To me, it means days where I can hold up in the library and read, I eventually replied. If not for this order to return home, my life would have been the very embodiment of peace. They meant your literal definition of peaceful. Because what you think is peaceful, or what you consider peaceful, and what they consider peaceful are apparently two entirely different things of what has happened at the Academy. Jeez. And sorry, that was my hands hitting the desk. Or tapping the desk, I should say. Because I had lifted my hands up and then rested on my, on my desk, so yeah. My return to Airfest had been ordered right after my lessons had ended and I could begin visiting the library. As far as I was concerned, it was perfectly reasonable for me to grumble and demand that they give me back my library and reading time. Sylvester let out a heavy sigh. We didn't call you back on a whim, you know. Rose Minecarsa added, do you know why we ordered your return? I placed a contemplative hand on my cheek. There were three mistakes that immediately came to mind. Blasting holes in the canopy of my bed with my water gun, terrifying everyone during the bookworm tea party, and passing out despite being the host. However, the latter regarding my water gun modifications hadn't contained any criticism whatsoever. I was summoned back right after the traditional Befallen incident, so maybe because I joined the battle without consulting anyone and ended up collapsing, I ventured, would that be it? What do you mean, maybe? I'm just struggling to understand what I've done to deserve a scolding. I don't think I've made that many mistakes, especially compared to last year, I said, tilting my head. It was a response that made all three of my guardians sigh. First, Ferdinand said, lining up the reports from the Royal Academy, is the way you write your reports. You can write proper reports for the printing industry and for temple matters, so why are your reports on Royal Academy affairs so poor? For what reason do you concentrate on topics of such little importance? I actually had a clear answer to that question. My scholars already sent you reports on what they feel is important, and it seems kind of pointless for me to focus on the same things. 
I thought it would be better to get out, go out of my way to write about the details that Hartman skipped. It seemed that my concern had been wasted on them. I had also been writing my reports with the same mindset as when I was in school back in Earth and would write letters to my guardians. But that evidently wasn't what Ferdinand and the others wanted. Instead, they wanted, needed my reports to be a lot more analytical in nature. Duh. I thought you would all appreciate an insight into what your children are getting up to at school, so I made my report similar to a diary of sorts that covered more personal topics, I continued. If you find this unsatisfactory, I would rather you tell me exactly what kind of report you want instead. I see, Ferdinand said. That would explain why your reports were so overly emotional. Henceforth, write them as you do for the printing industry. Try to industry and focus on the improvements of your students, of our students' grades, the spreading of trends, and the activities of your so-called library committee. Of that, I finally understood what kind of reports my guardians wanted. If they needed them to be written from a work perspective, mine certainly wasn't cutting it. Duh. From there, my guardians pointed out various of the problems with my words and, act with my words and actions. The most substantial were centered around how I handled the members of my library committee. I had promised to give Hildebrand an armband without seeking permission, Refused to immediately hand over the magic tools, registered him as an assistant, and tried to make him take on work. Well, I mean, she was giving reasons as to why it probably wouldn't be a good idea for him to be the masters of the shoe mills. So, I mean, it's not like she outright refused and said, I can't do that. They're mine. Because, I mean, she did list out reasons like, does he have the light nat dark darkness attribute? Does it want to be called my lady despite being a man? Does he, what, does he mind coming here even though he has to be staying out of sight? I mean, hello... Kind of logical reasons here. It's not like she outright refused. She did give... Because if he had said okay to all those things and that he was still okay with it despite all that, then yes, yeah, she would have done it. Dude. She was just making sure that he wanted all this before he even... Hello, thinking things through here. But he's a library committee member, I said. What will he do if he not if not work in the library? As far as the reports say, the only work that your committee has been given is to supply mana, Sylvester said flatly. Prompting students to return their overdue books is not your job. I hung my head feeling dejected. He was right. Solange had already seemed hesitant about giving work to an Archduke candidate such as me, yet I had taken things a massive step forward further by suggesting that we entrust work to a literal prince. And to add insult to injury, I had done it all without consulting her first. I'm sorry, Professor Solange. Uh, Professor Solange kept saying how helpful and overall wonderful these ordinances from Ferdinand were. So I just assumed having a prince take up the role would be even better, I said. The perfect person for the job, I thought. It is not up to you to decide who should take on which jobs, Ferdinand replied. A royal may give you any order they like, but you must not give an order to a royal. After considering their words, I concluded that I had been treating Hildebrand as a comrade in arms when he was actually like the son of a CEO in a company where I was on the lowest rung of the corporate ladder. And of course, while giving work to a colleague was perfectly acceptable, giving work to the small child who had just was just visiting to play certainly wasn't. Okay, that explains why everyone froze up. I cradled my head in regret, finally understanding what a colossal blunder I had made. Only then did I realize the consequences that the prince continuing to hang out with us in the library committee would have, and it made me want to cry. Even during my Arano days, there was never a time where I had inten intent needed to interact with someone whose status was so much higher than my own. Well, I mean, your world is, does have that kind of status, but not to that same effect, and there's hardly any royals in comparison to commoners, so yeah. In that case, what should I do now, I asked. Would it not be a problem for me to ignore Prince Hildebrand when Lady Hanelor and I are discussing our workloads, especially when he wishes to join in our conversation? I imagine the prince will end up feeling left out, but what am I supposed to do about that? I had simply paid close attention to his expression when talking about the armbands and reacted accordingly, but perhaps it would have been better for me to ignore it. Ferdinand gave a very sharp frown. You always swiftly and accurately identify what the person you are seeking to wants or speaking to wants and or needs based on minor gestures and expressions during conversation. That is not bad in and of itself. One can even call it a virtue. However, you never consider the context of whom you are speaking to or account for the intentions of those around you. That is why everyone always struggles to follow up your actions. I always placed all my focus on the person I was speaking with and was more than willing to befriend anyone regardless of whether they were royalty or from a greater duchy. However, according to Ferdinand, that generally led to me troubling those around us or creating much greater problems. You have what it takes to become a powerful weapon if you can learn to start taking context into consideration, Ferdinand said. But for now, you are little more than a danger who ne makes the future entirely unpredictable. This is especially true when royalty is involved. It has become impossible to say where Aaron Fest will stand in the years to come. 
I averted my eyes, aware that Ferdinand had told me to avoid interacting with royalty by any means necessary. But I mean, when the kid, when it's a kid, and uh, they, you can't afford to say no to royalty when they ask for something. And, uh, yeah, it'd be rude to ignore royalty when they're sitting right in front of you. So, I kind of have very limited options in that scape, in that, uh, scope of things. Although I understood what my guardians were trying to say, I couldn't make any promises. Ferdinand, upon noticing my attitude, looked at me with a frown. Do not look away from me, Rosemine, he said. Just what are you plotting this time? I can't avoid dealing with Prince Hildebrand now. It's too late for me to promise anything. And why is that? Because I plan to continue being friends with him. I was also invited to visit the palace library, and there's no way I can throw away my chance to secure permission for that. Solange, Handler, and Hildebrand, a librarian and two bookworms. They were the three people I wanted to be friends with more than anyone in the Royal Academy, and from this point onward, I wanted to involve myself with them as much as possible. I would accept, I would accept advice from my guardians on how to go about getting closer with my new friends, but I wasn't willing to stop interacting with them entirely. You can forget about the palace library. Sylvester said with a harsh expression, you passed out just from hearing its name, didn't you? If you actually went there, you'd probably collapse. Fire off random blessings and who knows what else. I'm not going to give you permission to go there until you learn to control yourself. And either way, since you're underage, you won't be able to go to the Royal Palace without a guardian. Isn't that way too cruel, I exclaimed, Despair desperately looking between my three guardians. But they were all wearing expressions that made it clear they would not accompany me. This was bad. The self-restraint I had abandoned so long ago was suddenly something I needed quite severely. But how could I restrain myself when faced with the palace library? I had no faith that I could. The palace library, I mumbled to myself. On the surface, it seemed as though I could go there after learning some self-restraint, but I knew it was just a thinly veiled attempt to keep me away from it permanently. After all, that how could they evaluate my progress when it was impossible to gauge another person's self-restraint in the first place? But I want to go... At the very least, we can hardly let you go until you've stopped collapsing out of nowhere. Karstad said, you caused an immense amount of stress for Prince Hildebrandt and his retainers this time, didn't you? Yeah, the poor kid was about to cry. You almost made him cry. Poor kid. You traumatized him. In short, he was asking me whether I wanted to traumatize everyone in the palace library. I slumped my shoulders. I didn't want to do that. No. Because I'm sure that Hildebrand would want to accompany you there to the palace library because he because they were the ones that, you know, offered the idea in the first place. And you traumatize him more by, by collapsing more. It was more than obvious to me by this point that my collapsing in front of people that wasn't good for their hearts and that the follow-up was especially rough. Ah, the palace library is so far away now. You did not seem to understand the distance you needed to keep between yourself and royalty, but that should not cause any further problems as long as you commit the fact that you are not equals to memory. Ferdinand said, now let us move on to the tradition of Fallen. Wolfrey's report had mostly been about his excitement over his first battle. Charlotte had more offered a more business-like perspective as she hadn't been there in person, and Han Hartmus had focused on the repairing of the gathering spot while praising me again and again for my saintly behavior. Ye gods, Hartman! Were you possessed when writing this? <laughs> that was me hitting my arm on my arm man on my chair. I don't even use them really. It was hard to believe they actually focused on the same event for and continued. Tell us what happened in your own words. And so I did, although it felt as though I was just filling in the details that were missing from Charlotte's report. Ferdinand must have felt similarly as he was actually adding notes to her report as I spoke. I tried not to look at Hartman's report at all. Still, I am impressed that one of you recognized the Trinus Profond from Roderick's description alone, Ferdinand noted. It is an exceedingly rare beat Fabies found in work stock. I would not have expected a student to recognize one. Lenore seems to have researched them all while going through Fabies documents in preparation for last year's dinner games at the introductory tournament, I explained. She said they were too dangerous to be used in dinner, so they were one of the babies she hadn't taught to the other apprentice knights. I once read the same document, Ferdinand said. I also once heard about them from a workstock apprentice knight, although workstock has now been split between Ehrensbach and Dunkelfogger and no longer truly exists. I went on the, to detail the fight with the Trinusperfond. I described how I had rushed to the battlefield to grant the darkness blessings, how my attacks had all missed, how I had used the divine cape, and, now, and how I had regenerated the gathering spot. When Professor Rothman came up with the Sovereignty Knights Order, he asked me a lot of questions, but my head was so fuzzy by that point, I didn't even ma I didn't manage to give any proper answers, I said. I ended up leaving while they were planning to a day to interrogate me on the details, but Professor Hersher seems to have worked things out for the time being. 
What did he say, ask, and what did you answer, Ferdinand probed. But when I repeated our exchange, my guardians grabbed their heads and groaned. He didn't seem satisfied with my answers, and it seems like I'm going to be summoned for an inquiry soon, I said. I would imagine so, Ferdinand remarked dryly. But what else could I have said to him, I asked. I knew the prayers for reading the Bible, which was necessary for me to do as the high bishop, and I could perform the healing ritual because it was done as part of my work in the temple. That was all there was to it. I had no more details to give. We will need to emphasize during the hearing that your prayers differ from the spell that the knights use. Hmm? The spell that knights use is forbidden from being taught at the Royal Academy. But why? Isn't it important to know for when dangerous babies like Tradishper Fallen show up? Perhaps, but there is something far more dangerous than babies. Humans. According to Ferdinand, the spell for making black weapons had stopped being taught at the Royal Academy long ago. After a political upheaval that caused a mana shortage not unlike our own, some archdukes had tried to enrich their duchies by invading others with black weapons. It was an especially dangerous situation for some, as there was very little a du lesser duchy could do against an invading greater duchy. Others were inspired by the invasion, and the upheaval soon dissolved into even greater chaos. From that point on, it was forbidden to teach everyone the spell for making black weapons in the Royal Academy. Instead, only the knights ordered that oversaw territories where Phoebes that absolutely needed black weapons to be defeated were taught it. How come Cornelius and the others didn't know the spell then, I asked? Isn't it necessary for them to learn it? It used to be that the knights order would teach apprentice knights once they entered the knights course and receive their divine protection from the gods. Now, however, we only teach it to the fully grown knights we've determined we can bring with us on missions. What inspired the change? Karstek glanced at me and shrugged. As you know, we have more nobles who used to be blue robes, and the education level dropped after the Civil War shook up the Royal Academy courses. For safety's sake, we only bring knights who can pro properly coordinate on missions. We only teach the spell to those who've earned our approval. Ah, it's all because of Shikikosa. Great! Because of this guy. Him again! That reminded me. Ferdinand had scolded Karstek for not training the newbies properly and told him to rethink how he managed them. It was after Shikiko's little rampage that the rules for training newcomers had been modified, meaning that those a little older than Angelica would know the spell, but it was completely unknown to those in Angelica's grade and below. The current newcomers were so bad at coordinating that they wouldn't be taught it for a very long time. So, what's the difference between spells and prayers, I asked. Hmm, Karsta considered my question for a moment. Well, prayers are too long to use in battle. You also wouldn't want to risk messing up a word and then having the prayer fail to activate, so they were compacted down into spells. It seems that the spells used by knights were, in fact, prayers that were being slowly shaved down over time. There wasn't much room for them to be modified, unlike a full-on prayer, but the speed and lack of room for error was most important. Huh. I guess you learn everything, you learn something new every day. Yep. You learn a lot new stuff every day. Oh, right, right. This is for you, Ferdinand, I said. It's a gift from Hartmut. He drew the magic circle that arose when I healed the gathering spot with a blessing. I handed up with the drawing in question. Both Sylvester and Carstead leaned closer to peer at it, and then swiftly looked away, probably unable to understand it. Ferdinand alone traced his finger across the lines. Rosemine, did you pour your mana into this, he asked. It rose up on its own when I performed the heat earth healing ritual, I applied. What does it do? It is a necessary component of the area functioning as the Arenfest gathering spot. As you might imagine, it is quite complex with many effects woven into it, he said, his mouth softening a little as he spoke. I could tell that he was extremely happy to see it, which made me happy in turn, namely because it meant he would probably lecture me less. Helping to improve his mood even further, I peered at the magic circle and asked what effects he meant. Hold it, Rose mind, Sylvester. Sensing that Ferdinand was about to begin an impromptu lesson, a magic circle was quickly interjected with a frown. Is it revitalizing the Earth, the Sovereign Temple's job? I took matters into my own hands since the other Arenfest students needed ingredients for their classes, and if my retainers had their classes stalled, it would impact my ability to visit the library. Maybe it was a job normally done by the Sovereign Temple, but it hadn't been a situation where I could just casually sit around. At the time, I empathized that I hadn't completely stolen all the work the Turdish Profond hadn't rampaged exclusively in the Arenfest storm gathering spots, so there was plenty of cursed ground in the forest. The problem's not about whether you left them work, although I can't deny that you helped out the students, Sylvester said. This is an extraordinary magic circle for an endnote. To use it completely, dozens of sovereign blue priests and shrine maidens would need to work for days on end. I'm impressed that your mana sufficed. It didn't suffice at all, I replied. I needed to chug rejuvenation potions while I was restoring the earth. But I felt like my mana was being sucked out as soon as it was recovered. It was really rough. Rough should not even begin to describe it, for Ned muttered as he continued to examine the circle, but what was done was done. It seems that you fully re regenerated the gathering spot, but did you bring any ingredients from it back with you? 
I don't believe so. The magic circle was one thing, but I hadn't even considered bringing back any newly grown ingredients. They were there for classes. Instruct Hartman to send some from the re uh, regenerated portion of the gathering spot for Nesset. I wish to see if your mana has caused them to change at all. You truly are Professor Hersher's disciple, Ferdinand. It seems that you prioritize your research just as much as she does, I observed. She came along with the Knight's Order, but when she saw the hunt had ended without any particular injuries, she tried to return to her laboratory right away. I, thought, I added that it would have liked for her to be a little bit more worried about us, but that just made Ferdinand lower his eyes ever so slightly. Ferdinand? Back in the Royal Academy, whenever I slew Fabies in the forest with the Apprentice Knights, Hersher would come to check on us out of concern. Her interruption seemed such a waste of time that I would shoo her away and tell her not to bother us unless someone was injured. That is likely why. So it's all your fault! Ferdinand and Hersher's experiences had completely warped their idea of trust. At this rate, Raymond was in genuine danger. But as I worried about him, my three guardians collectively sighed. Forget about the Aaron's Box student. Worry about yourself. Ah, sorry. Even from that point onward, I didn't receive much in the way of a lecture. My exhausted guardian simply ended the meeting after informing the, me they would be sending me back to the Royal Academy after the dedication ritual, since they wanted to minimize my contact with royalty. It was actually kind of strange. Not that I wanted them to yell at me or anything, but why, I wonder? I almost want to ask in case I've just forgotten, but doing that would definitely earn me a scolding of some kind, so I won't. They were sending me back earlier this year since they wanted me to start working on my socializing skills once Hildebrand was once Hildebrand was confined to his room again. I can't say I care all that much about returning to the Royal Academy when my days are going to be spent socializing rather than the library, though. The only part of socializing that actually appealed to me was attending tea parties with Hanalore when we would discuss books. But I doubt that anyone permits such a meeting when I was more or less guaranteed to collapse again. Uh, life never goes the way you want it to. No, it does not. Dinner at a tea party. Oddly, do you send this letter to the Royal Academy, I said, meaning that I want it given to the knights guarding the teleportation room. It was a letter to Hartman asking him to gather ingredients from the regenerated gathering spot. Upon seeing who the letter was addressed to, Oddly made a worried expression. Lady Rose went, how is Hartman doing at the Royal Academy, she asked. Is he bothering the others by chance? Hartman puts in a tremendous amount of effort into gathering information and laying foundations for me, on top of diligently writing reports to my adopted for my adopted father, I provide. There's no mistaking that he is having a grand time at the Royal Academy. I can feel just how energetic he is through the reports I read today. My aim was simply to relieve Audley's concerns, so I said no more on the subject. I could hardly tell him that, tell her that Hartman was starstruck by my repairing of the gathering spot and praised the gods in a fervor over me truly being a saint. Milady, it's about time for dinner, Riarda said. Please put down your pen. I obliged and stood up. At dinner, time, dinner tonight, I was going to be speaking with Bonifacius about the traditional fallen hunt. But what should I say? Hartman's report makes it sound like I was right in the thick of it all. Won't Grandfather be disappointed to learn the truth? My internal debate continued even when I arrived at the dinner table. Ferdinand was in attendance as well. But a fascist was seated next to me and I answered his questions while we ate. And so from Roderick's words alone, Lenore deduced that we were denealing with a turnish for fallen, I explained. I departed post haste to bless everyone's weapons with darkness, but when we got, arrived at the gathering spot, we found it empty. The battle had moved to the forest, as Matthias and the others had who had accompanied Roderick on his gathering had already lured it away. By the time we reached them, groups led by Matthias and Wilfrid were stalling the now massive Ternishbrafon. It was larger than Roderick had reported due to Traga having struck it with a full power attack. Traga, you say? The smile disappeared from Bonifacio's face and was replaced with a grave seriousness. Hmm. Ah, uh, but, uh, he was not really to blame, I said, hurriedly trying to defend Traga. The students had not yet learned what attributes Turnus performance had. Carset grimaced. He was listening in while standing behind Sylvester as his guard knight. That's not an excuse, I'm afraid, he said. It's on him for being too short-sighted to see the significance of Matthias and the others buying time without attacking. Yeah, because he could have just asked, why are you guys not attacking? Should we not be fighting it? And then they would tell him what was going on, and he should be like, oh, okay, best to try and buy time. No, he didn't. There was no issues this time since everyone survived, but what could you say in his defense if the enlarged Trinistrophon had claimed several students' lives? In essence, he was saying that such a tragedy had only been avoided because of the skilled students who had covered Traga's mistake. I shook my head, unable to argue with that. We began attacking once everyone had the God of Darkness's blessing, I said, continuing my explanation. I joined in, firing my water gun, but I was unable to hit the Trinistrophon even a single time. It seemed entirely focused on avoiding my attacks. That comes as no surprise, Ferdinand said, raising an eyebrow. As far as I can understand, 
from your explanation. This so-called water gun of your fa yours fires mana, correct? Weapons with the God of Darkness's blessing steal twice as much mana from the enemy as they were infused with. It's only natural that it would focus on you more than anyone else. Indeed, Rosemine Bonifacius added, you were a greater threat to the Trinistra Fallen than anyone else, and it was so distracted trying to evade your attacks that it became full of openings for others to exploit, right? You contributed a lot more to the fight than you know. Well done. Bonifacius was the pinnacle of strength, so receiving his praise was like being recognized as super strong myself. I leaned toward him slightly, pleased to hear that I had been of some use, and said, Would stopping it in place with the God of Darkness's cape count as contributing too? The God of Darkness's cape, he repeated. The Trinish Profond was watching me too closely for any of my attacks to land, so I thought I should block its vision. I turned my water gun into the God of Darkness's cape, which I then used to cover its head, but of course I no longer had a weapon then, so I couldn't even go in for the kill. Did you just say you changed your weapon, Karstad asked? He was the first to react. Yes, I replied, since you can change the form of your weapon without canceling the God of Darkness's blessing. No, you cannot. Once you turn something into a black weapon, it can't be changed back until after it is dispelled. Huh? I looked at Ferdinand for an explanation. That may be one difference between spells and blessings, he said. I am highly interested in researching what other dis dissimilarities there may be, but it is rare for knights to need to change weapons in the middle of a trombe hunt. There will presumably be no need for them to memorize the prayers now. According to Ferdinand, spells were prayers that had deliberately been simplified and shortened over time to be better used in battle. This meant that even if prayers allowed one to change their weapons, they were still much less convenient overall. We can, you can use the divine instruments, Rosemine, Bonifacius asked. Yes, Grandfather. They are very familiar to me thanks to my temple upbringing. Is something wrong with that? No, it's just surprising. I didn't know anyone else could freely use the divine instruments, he replied. Not everyone raised in the temple is alike, I see. Apparently, none of the blue priests who had risen to become knights had ever used divine instruments. The only blue priest turned knight I was aware of was the now deceased Chikakosa, so all I could say to that was, why don't they use them when they're so convenient? Seeing my confusion, Ferdinand set down his cutlery, looking clearly exasperated. Normal nobles do not visit the temple, as they neither see nor touch the divine instruments. Being raised in the temple is also considered a stain on one's reputation, so no former blue priest would consider using a divine instrument as their own weapon, lest it remind others of their upbringing. And above all else, divine instruments require an enormous amount of mana to use, an unnecessarily large burden for an average priest turned knight to, be, to bear. Not to mention, Karsta added, they have, cup, they have complex magic circles and decorations that are much too hard to replicate. Sylvester nodded. I've seen them on the shrines before, but I wouldn't be able to remember them clearly enough, he said. In addition to all this, Rosemine, you are the only person who, could, who would view the divine instruments as little more than convenient tools to use, Ferdinand added. They are meant to be wielded by the gods themselves. Most would be too humble to use them as personal weapons. I don't want to hear that from you, Ferdinand, I snapped. He used them as convenient tools way more than I do. He was the one who had given me Laden Shaft's spear to use as a weapon and taught me how to use the God of Darkness's cape as I was entirely against him trying to saddle me with the blame. I recall saying that you should use the cape as a last resort, as the ultimate ace up your sleeve, he replied. I did not anticipate that you would use it for something as moronic as blocking a creature's sight because it continued to dodge your attacks, fool. Ugh, I'm sorry. One could use the God of Darkness's cape to absorb mana from an opponent, and with that in mind, Ferdinand had told me to use it sparingly, when I was backed into a corner and without any mana. Instead, I had decided to use it because I needed a really big cough. It seemed our conversation wasn't going in my favor, so I swiftly retreated to my ori our original focus. Putting aside the question of using divine instruments as weapons for now, I succeeded in blocking the traditional fallen's vision, and with a triple attack from Cornelius, Wilfred, and Traga, we succeeded in defeating the beast. I was not awarded too many contribution points, so I decided to leave the ingredient gathering to Cornelius and Roderick while I went to regenerate the gathering spot. One moment, Rosemine, Bernabasha stopped me with a stern expression as I tried to move on from the cape. You blessed everyone's weapons with darkness, drew the Turnish Profond's attention, and then froze it in place by obscuring its vision. You should have received more contribution points than anyone. Well, I don't really... didn't really need it. I stared at him quizzically. If that really was the case, nobody had said anything at the time. Everyone had agreed that Cornelius contributed the most, before we had taken second place. Considering that I had only received ingredients for Roderick's face stone, surely my contribution points hadn't been that high. Are contribution points not distributed based on the amount of damage done, I asked? Setting the stage for inflicting damage is what matters most, Bonifacius passionately replied. Judging by what you've said, you and Lenore contributed the most. Her by immediately identifying the Fae Beast as a traditional fallen, and you by giving everyone else the means to start hurting it. 
If you give points based on damage alone, then more impatient idiots like Trogat will start charging hence long into bet danger, hoping to get more credit. The Knights had apparently chosen an incorrect system for distributing contribution points. I looked for, to Sylvester and Carson for second opinions, and they both agreed that the Knights had been in the wrong. Bonifacius is right. By focusing only on who inflicts the most damage, they're encouraging students to rush in alone, Carson has said. At this rate, they'll never learn to cooperate properly. This must be another downside to speed dinner being the only kind of dinner played nowadays, Bonifacius said with annoyance. We'll need to research, reteach them about contribution points too. What rubbish is the Royal Academy even teaching these days? I have to agree. His words reminded me of the Knights' written lessons. There was a study guide for distributing contribution points, so I imagine the proper system was taught in class, I said. The problem seems to be the way they taught it. The examples they learned during lessons are so unlike what they actually experience that they never truly understand. Lenore said something to that effect last year. Cornelius was the one who decided on the points this time, and the biggest problem is that no one pointed at his mistake. Seems like they all need to be re-educated, Bonifacio said. His special training for the apprentices was far from over, apparently. My condolences to the apprentice knights who are going to have to go through retraining of Bonifacius. Good luck. You're going to need it. I spent the next few days reading the book I had borrowed from Hanalore, and soon enough, it was time for my tea party with Elvira and Florencia. It would only be the three of us this time, and considering that Elvira and Florencia were basically my socializing instructors, things were a little tense. It's unfortunate that you were ordered to return home so soon, Florencia said. No doubt you were looking forward to socializing with your friends. I can't reveal that Lady Hanalore is basically my only friend and that being summoned back to Erenfest isn't a particularly big deal as a result. Oh, and I definitely can't say that I would have avoided socializing entirely to spend all my time in the library if possible. Feeling a cold sweat run down my back, I lowered my eyes with as much forced melancholy as I can muster. It cannot be helped. I made far too many blunders with Prince Hildebrand. I told Sylvester not to scold you too harshly, Florencia noted. He wasn't too hard on you, was he? I don't know. Wow, I have been wondering why I was getting shattered at so less, op so, at so less often this year, and now I have my answer. As it turned out, Florencia had scolded Sylvester when he was preparing to lecture me into the ground. It will only stifle her growth if you can ignore her accomplishments, raising our duchy's grades, increasing our influence in the Royal Academy, and establishing bonds with greater duchies that we previously lacked, simply to hone in on one of her mistake on her mistakes, she had said. Of course, Florencia continued with a kind smile, that is not to say that your socializing has no problems whatsoever. There is much for you to learn, however, that is a separate issue from your triumphs getting unrecognized. We are all aware that you were raised in the temple and therefore lack the common sense expected of nobles, so it is up to us to construct, instruct you on these matters. Why didn't you do this? In a shocking twist, I was informed that Florencia had come down hard on Ferdinand and said to him, We may scold her if she fails to do what we have taught her, but for mistakes that are stemmed from things we have overlooked, we must first scold ourselves for failing as teachers. Compared to last year, there has been a noticeable improvement on your socializing skills, Florencia said. You are capable of working hard for one's duchy's, our duchy's sake and Rosemine, so I am not particularly worried. Florencia is starting to seem like a saint. No, a holy mother. She gave me the encouragement that my guardians hadn't, moving me beyond words. I smiled at her and she gave me a simply divine smile in return. Please make many friends in the World Academy, Florencia went on. Close friends are an invaluable treasure. Even during the Arch 2 conference, diplomacy will change dramatically based on whether you have socialized with others there. I will do my best, I replied. But Florencia, that's a very big ask. I understood that she was telling me to make friends for my own sake after saving me from my guardian's furious lectures, which made it all the more difficult for me to just read books instead. Uh, her hopes for me are too heavy of a burden, and that smile, no, 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 I just want to read. I took a sip of my tea to hide my internal screaming. Alvara, who had been listening to us quietly, set down her cup inside. It seemed that she was on the verge of complaining about something or another. A habit of hers I had picked up on while having tea with her before my baptism. The question is, will she be complaining about her husband or one of her sons? At least you are showing effort and care, Rosemine. I only wish that much could be said about the brides of our family. Oh, the brides. Alvara looked at Angelica, who was standing behind me as a guard. I, oh, Angelica, of course. She's going to complain about that. Because Angelica doesn't want to think. She wants to leave all the thinking to everybody else and do as little thinking as possible, which means no thinking about, oh, what do I want to do for my ma for my marriage, for my wedding, you know, all that stuff. She doesn't want to think about all that. So, of course, Evara's going to complain about that. Angelica thinks only of getting stronger, and Eckert hardly seems to care about marriage either. During social occasions, they simply stand to the side and smile, 
making no attempt to interact with others at all. Do you believe they might fix themselves up a bit after marriage, dear? Angelica will never change, I said. I cannot even imagine a time where she might proactively socialize or host any events. That is why her parents advised against the marriage, is it not? I believe you should not expect so much from them. Well, I mean, isn't Angelica going to be a second wife, which means that she doesn't do any socializing anyway? Right? Am I correct on that? Let me know. Avera let out a defeated sigh in response. I know, I know. Angelica, meanwhile, gave a beaming smile. That's Lady Rosemine for you. She understands me so well. I don't think I'll be able to change that easily either. Why do you only ever speak eagerly at times like this, Angelica? Angelica had so little interest in marriage that it was safe to say she didn't care at all. And while Elvira had told Edgar that to search for her first wife, he had refused, saying that it would be bad for his reputation to look for another woman while already being engaged to Angelica. He had ultimately said that he would only start looking for a first wife about, about three years after his marriage. Okay. Angelica's wedding was planned for when she was about 20 years old, the age at which it became harder for women to marry. By saying that he intended to wait another three years after that, he presumably meant that he never planned to take a first wife. Eckert has given his name to Lord Ferdinand, has he not, Avara said? He cannot become the Knight Commander as a result, nor can he, can he inherit our house. I suppose I'll just be glad that he is thinking of marrying at all, but there is the matter of Aurelia too, she shook her head. The problem is not her ability to socialize, as she has proven she is more than capable, but rather getting her into social situations to begin with. I might have to give up on that entirely for now. There is not much that can be done about that, I suppose. Uh, Mother, did something happen to Aurelia, I asked, concerned? Avara and Florencia exchanged ga glances, giggled, and then lowered her voices. Or lowered their voices. She has conceived, Florencia said. What? When did this happen? When does this happen? Because I'm assuming that the only time that they are alone is... Actually, now that I think about it... That makes perfect sense, because the only time they would be alone and she'd be comfortable enough to remove her veil would be when they're alone, and that would be at night when they're going to bed, and you can probably guess what is happening. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, how many told your mother that you're uh, going to be a dad? Oh, dear, Lambert, you were going to have a hard time with this. She is with trials, Rosemont, Elvira, and reiterated. I widened my eyes, and they both nodded silently in confirmation. Is it a boy or a girl, I asked. I will need to prepare books as gifts, toys as well. There are so many things I can provide. Do calm down. Her pregnancy was only recently discovered. We do not yet know whether the baby will come to full term. What? What do you mean? Elvira explained that it was not easy to provide babies with a continuous stream of mana. Those who, who received too little were likely to be born with only a small amount of mana, but conversely, those who received too much at once were prone to being miscarried. Ooh. So you gotta balance how much mana you give the baby during your pregnancy. So too little, and the baby won't have very much mana, but it will survive. Too much, and it could die. So you gotta try and find a middle ground somehow. The latter situation won't well, was good for the baby's, the mother's body either. It was important not to give the baby too much mana prior to its birth. But at the same time, a newborn would receive extremely difficult treatment based on its mana quantity. I was left speechless. I struggled to remember the last time I had felt this kind of culture shock. Baby, nobles sure don't have it easy. Children are never made public before their baptism, so do keep this to yourself, Elvira said. I nodded cautiously. She was effectively saying it was impossible to know what might happen to the baby, depending on its mana quantity. Putting aside whether the baby is born, Aurelia does not seem fond of socializing, so Avara must pin her hopes on Lenora, Florentia said, shifting the topic of conversation away from Aurelia. Oh, she knows! She knows! She was right! She was right in her guess! Sorry, guys, I'm trying to adjust how I'm sitting. Lenore is an Aaronfest Arch archdouble of the same faction, so she will most likely be trained to handle faction politics as Avara's successor. Hmm? Lenore? I blinked, unsure of why she was being brought up now of all times. She is Cornelius's partner. Now, how'd she figure it out? That's what I wonder. I am told they are keeping your relationship a secret so as to avoid hindering their work, but did you not notice nonetheless? And not at all, I replied. I had sensed that Lenore was crushing on him, but that not that she had actually taken her shot and six scored. Neither of them had shown any indication of anything happening between them. Now that I think about it, I seem to recall them doing more guard duty together as of late. Wait, am I the only one who didn't know about this? Mother, do you know what brought them together? 
I do not know the details myself. No matter how much I ask, he simply replies that he refuses to be turned into a book like Lamprey. I can understand that. <laughs> yeah, I can understand how Cornelius felt, but surely he understood that he was only delaying the inevitable. Do Lenore's relatives know, I asked? We will need to speak to them, or we not? They have known from the moment she began preparing clothes to attend Cornelius' graduation ceremony. I have spoken to her mother about this often. Cornelius visits, th visits them briefly as well. Surprisingly enough, it seemed that Cornelius had already laid out all the proper groundwork. There had apparently been plenty of time for him to do this with, with him how often I was in the temple. I was aware he was trying to keep it a secret from you, Rosemine, but I see he was quite thorough indeed, Florencia said with a giggle. I would expect nothing less from Elvira's son. It was through Eckert that Elvira had found out about Ferdinand's days in the Royal Academy. Cornelius, knowing this, had been more on guard against me than anyone since I was in a position to learn all sorts of things about him and was highly susceptible to Elvira's influence. Oh, boy. According to Cornelius's letter, he plans to formally greet Lenore's parents once she has finished her classes and while you are busy with the dedication ritual, Elvira said. I intend to use that opportunity to write, bring as much information from him as possible. Although I do not expect it to be easy considering how much his guard is up. I don't blame him, though. I can understand why he would be cautious with me given the position I'm in, but did he really have to be so thorough, I asked? This seems downright excessive. Is there something more to it? He said that if you learned about him choosing Lenore, you would always assign them together at work, ensure that they sit together at meals, and generally make it so obvious that everyone would tease him to death. Oh, she probably would. Yeah, I averted my eyes. That was absolutely the case. It seemed that he wanted to keep their relationship hidden until just before graduation, since there would be fewer embarrassing situations for him to endure once he was out of the academy. He is less worried about his own discomfort once since he is soon to graduate, Florencia explained. Rather, he is worried about Lenore, who is going to be in the Royal Academy for another year. Do be considerate toward them, Rosemine. I will take great care, I replied with a nod. Florencia's gaze, tur gaze turned to Elvira, and you as well, Elvira, she said. I know that your romantic Royal Academy love story is quite popular, but if you do not wait until they have both graduated, will you not be making things miserable for Lenore, trapping her in the dormitory with no escape? Her indigo eyes softened into a smile. I am sure that Lenore will speak of these flowery days herself during a tea party in the future. I suppose. I have already collected quite a few romance stories, so there's no need to hurry. I shall exercise patience and wait, Elvira said, but her dark eyes were burning with a passion that made it clear she would wrench every last secret from Cornelius and Lenore the moment they showed even the slightest weakness. Oh, y'all, I better keep y'all's guard up a lot, <laughs> as much as you can, because she will, she will find a weakness and she will exploit it. Not. That reminds me, I said, Lady Handler of Dunkelfogger expressed high praise for our romance heavy night stories. I allowed her to borrow a copy of Royal Academy Love Stories during a tea party we had and told her apprentice scholars that I am willing to buy Dunkelfogger romance stories from them. We may be getting new material very soon. Splendid work, Rose Minovara said, her eyes sparkling. As expected, the Royal Academy was indeed the best place to gather stories from other duchies. And the more stories from different school years that one acquired, the harder it was to tell which were based on whom. Greater anonymity would inspire even more people to share stories, or so Elvira said at the height of a very passionate speech. Royal Academy Love Story sells more than any other book printed in Haldensdale, Elvira explained. Thus, my book writing is all for the sake of my birthplace. It seemed that Haldensdale had more or less become a printing industry focused entirely on romance novels. I understood that they needed the sales because of how harsh the cold was on their land, but I was still impressed that Gabe Haldensdale had given his permission for such a thing considering how stern he looked. Oh, that reminds me. The Haldensdale miracle is quite the popular topic this winter, Florencia noted. She was regarding me with a meaningful smile as she spoke, but I didn't have a clue what she was talking about. What is this Haldensdale miracle, I asked? Where you did the actual spring prayer and caused spring to come early to Haldensdale. Duh. What do you think he's talking about? You reviving their ancient ceremony, she replied. During their last spring prayer, I had seen the men singing and pointed out that in the Bible... It was the goddesses who sung. Gabe Haldensdale had taken my advice and gotten the women to sing instead, and as a result, Verdrena, the goddess of thunder, had worked hard to melt all of the province in snow overnight. The weather had turned to that which would normally be considered the beginning of summer in Haldensdale, and this event had subsequently come to be known as the Haldensdale Miracle to the socializing nobles. You say that I revived ancient ceremonies, but I don't deserve that much credit. Was it not Gabe Haldensdale who decided to follow the Bible's customs? And the province's women who performed and provided their mana. It certainly was, but well, but if you hadn't mentioned it, it wouldn't have happened. Elvira smiled and told me how things had progressed in Haldensdale this year. Framework, or farm work had apparently begun earlier this year thanks to the snow melting overnight, 
and their harvest had practically doubled as a result. That's great. <sighs> of course, uh, Verdreda's blessing had not extended beyond Haldensdale, as I seen for myself when returning home by High Beast. The neighboring provinces had all experienced regular weather, which had resulted in Gieb Haldensdale receiving a lot of questions from the other Gieb's. He had made no mention of his own involvement in the incident and simply responded that it was a miracle brought about by the saint of Arenfest. Don't put it like that! You're not Hartmut! And so various Gieb's are flooding us with requests to meet with you and with questions about ancient ceremonies, Avara concluded. What will you do, Rosemine? Tell them to speak with Gieb Haldensdale. There aren't many any more questions... For Answers for me to give, I replied, rejecting any meetings. Florencia, who had not seen the ceremony in Haldensdale, looked at me quick, curiously. Did you not advise him on what to do, she asked. I simply pointed out that the roles of men and women had switched over the countless years, I said. If it was the, peop it was the people of Haldensdale who had preserved the ancient lyrics not saved anywhere else and continued the ceremony itself. I had noticed that the lyrics matched the poems in the Bible... But reading the Bible alone had not been enough for me to realize it was being used as a song in a, a ceremony. Although I performed with the others in the Gieb's request, I was clueless as to where and when everyone was supposed to stand. In fact, I was the only one who stayed prone on the ceremonial stage. All in all, it was really hard to credit me for this miracle. Not to mention I continued having me meet with the other Gieb's would only end in them asking me to visit for their spring prayer. No. That would certainly be their primary objective. All Gibbs and their people pray for spring to arrive as soon as possible, Arara said. She had grown up at Haldensdale, the province with the, long, the longest winter in Erinfest, and she explained just how much the northern provinces yearned for the melting of the snow. It was entirely understandable, even in the nobles' quarter, Erinfest winters were significantly longer than they were in Japan. However, I cannot attend every province's spring prayer ceremony, I said. I visited Haldensdale this year because I needed to bring the Gutenbergs but I have no plans to visit anywhere next spring. Blue Priest needed to visit provinces too. It was impossible for me to travel to them all by myself, considering my lack of time and stamina. A part of me does want to go to Haldensdale as I expect to be able to read warm, freshly printed books among the chilly air, I mused aloud. However, traveling there and there alone each year could easily be interpreted as favoritism, which would cause problems moving forward, no? It certainly would, Florencia replied. Your visits to Haldensdale must be kept to a minimum. That said, I see that your desire to visit is not for spring prayer, but instead to read. She gave a refined giggle, but what else would motivate me to go somewhere? I would like for all meetings requested due to the Haldensdale miracle to be refused, I said. If the Gieves of other provinces wish to know about the ceremony and stage, they will receive more detailed answers from Gieve Haldensdale. Alvara nodded. I understand your position, Rosemine. I will direct Gieves wishing to know about the ceremony to my brother. And speaking of which, here... A gift from Haldensdale. It is a collection of new romance stories written by my friend and me. I received the newly printed book from Elvira, looked it over, and then said what came to mind. Mother, please urge Gieb Haldensdale to begin printing the lyrics for the ritual and selling them to other Gieb's. You have the necessary printing process presses, and this way the lyrics can be preserved for other pro in other provinces as well. Elvira widened her eyes and nodded with a laugh. It is much like you to suggest selling them rather than simply distributing them for the purposes of preservation. It is valuable information that Hull and so carefully retained for many years, no? I think their efforts deserve a suitable price. After the tea party, I swiftly read the new book in my room. One of the love stories was a sad one about a late noble who fell in love with the daughter of a Gieb. And we're... Daniel! <laughs> this is a Daniel! And worked desperately to increase his mana capacity for her, only for the romance to ultimately fall through. Yeah, this is about Daniel! Some creative liberties had obviously been taken. Their names were changed. Bridget was turned to the daughter of Agib rather than his little sister, and it was ultimately the fact that Daniel had given his name that ended their relationship rather than the fact he was serving a member of the Archducal family. At this very core, though, the story was the same. During the climax, when Daniel was made to choose between his beloved and his lord to whom, the lord to whom he had given his name, a storm from the gods threw the scene into disarray, reflecting the depth of his pain. A goddess then descended to intone poverty or poetry and sweep her wide sleeves, bringing forth rain that withered the flowers it fell upon. Given the context, I could tell it was symbolic of the ache, agony of a broken heart, but I couldn't quite grasp the intensity it was trying to convey. But I could follow the plot this time, at least. Well, that's good. Ooh, Sylvester's Order. I want to continue! I want to continue so much, but I can't! I'll see y'all next time!